Good morning and welcome to Mount Airy. We're so glad to have you with us here today as we worship the Lord together, whether in person or online. Just want to give a personal update. A number of you have been praying for our transition and selling our home in Columbia, buying a home in Mount Airy. Uh, we're very happy to say that on Monday we had a contract um, that we, we accepted on our old home, and then Tuesday we went to see a home in Mount Airy and put in a, a bid for that, and it was accepted. So things are moving right along. By the end of the month, we should be moved into our new home. So we, next month of, of, of July, next, within 30 days, we will be, Lord willing, moved into our home in Mount Airy where we can be closer to all of you. And really, you have become very dear to our hearts as you have just lifted us up in prayer and have been so very kind and welcoming to our family. So thank you all. Uh, the youth will be going to the fireworks on July 3rd. So definitely see Emily if you're interested in, in being part of that. And small groups will be meeting throughout the summer. So if you feel like, I'd like some more community inside the church, go uh, see any of the, the small group leaders whose names are in the emails, or in the bulletin, with their email information, and they'd love to have you be a part of the small groups. With that being said, I'm going to let Butch uh, tell us one last announcement, and we'll turn our hearts to worship. Good morning. In Psalm 92, we read, It is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to sing his praises to his name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We now have several announcements uh, to give to the church family. Help in the nursery. Uh, we have need of more help in our nursery. If you would like to help about once every two months, please contact Stephanie. Ice Cream Social, that has everyone's attention. Our first women's ice cream social is scheduled for Monday evening, July 8th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at Jimmy Cone in Mount Airy. Rita's Frozen Custard in Mount Airy is a backup plan if there's rain. Women's Book Club. The first meeting of the Women's Book Club will be scheduled for July 28th. Please contact Laura if you're interested. Women's Conference. For ladies third grade and up, the Made for More Conference is being held on November 15th and 16th in Annapolis, Maryland. Please contact Laura for more information. And an add-on I was just given, I would like to say a word of thanks to Ken and Barb Schefter for leading our team to Fairmont this year. We had a great week. We had seven members from our church there and two grandchildren. So uh, please talk to them. You'll hear more about it later. We'll have a presentation and consider the possibility of going with us next year. Um, we go to serve the community, but at the end, we were the ones that are really blessed. Please join me in a call to worship from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. I shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. And we will declare your grace. We shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Please join with me in singing hymn 30, God our help in ages past.
You may be seated. John Calvin states, quote, faith is like an empty open hand stretched out toward God with nothing to offer and everything to receive, end quote. We now have the privilege of coming before our sovereign Lord with our prayers of invocation and praise. Please join with me in prayer. God of all sovereignty, your greatness is unsearchable. Your glory is above the heavens. We do not approach you because we deserve your notice, for we are sinful. Our necessities compel us. Your promises encourage us. Our hearts draw us, and the assurance of your acceptance moves us. You are all our good in times of peace, our only support in times of trouble, and our one sufficiency when life shall end. We thank you not only for the beauty of your creation as summer arrived, arrives and your creation comes alive before us, but also for being made alive in Christ and all the gifts of healing, forgiveness, hope, and purpose that we find in Christ. We thank you for the sustaining love of family and friends and the fellowship of faith in your church. We thank you for the members of Mount A Presbyterian Church, for their work of faith, for their labor of love, and for their steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the ongoing health concerns of those in our congregation, for Sharon, Tom, Artist B, Artist S, Joe, Paul, Georgia, and for Brooke and Jim, for strength, peace, healing, and encouragement. We pray for the relatives of those in our congregation, for Joe's daughter-in-law, Laura, and his granddaughter, Maria, for Cindy's parents, for Maxine's sister, Karen, for Steve's parents, Ed and Carrie, for Mary Sue's grandson, Andrew, and for Butch and Marcia's son, David. We pray for the unsaved in our families. We pray for our session, deacons, and church staff that you will fill them with wisdom as they serve our congregation. We pray for our local, state, and national government officials that they will govern by godly principles. We pray for members, relatives, and friends in active military duty and government service in foreign countries for their safety. We pray for the caregivers in our congregation for strength and joy and service of their loved ones. We pray for the people of countries of the world where there is strife or warfare, and for all who work for peace and international harmony. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ in every land. We pray for our missionaries, who you have called away from their homeland to serve you in foreign lands. We pray for their safety. We pray for open doors and open hearts as they share the love, the life-changing truth of salvation in Jesus Christ. We pray specifically for Anna and Kirk Norris as they begin their new rough ministry at the University of St. Louis. We are thankful that they have purchased a house in St. Louis. We pray that the children would adjust to their new home. We also pray particularly for their ministry to the international students. Lord, we also pray for their former students in the Ukraine who have been drafted to fight in the war with Russia. We ask all these things in the strong and loving name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you, Sovereign Lord, for hearing our prayers. Amen. We now have uh, the, the opportunity to read responsively from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. Notice in verse 6 that these words shall be on your hearts is addressed to the parents and grandparents. The responsibility is primarily on us and that we shall talk of these commandments when we sit at home, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, and when we get up. 
Please join with me in the response of reading. These are the commandments, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, Please stand and sing by faith.
responsively about the saints of old who also walked by faith and carried that legacy on down to us. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of unrighteousness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. We'll now go into a prayer of confession that we'll read responsively. Merciful and loving God, we come before you with humble hearts acknowledging our sins. You have taught us your ways, but we confess that we have not always listened. We have turned away from your teachings and failed to pass them on to the next generation. You have wrought salvation among us. Yet we have not always made Christ our all in all. We have not always trusted in you or remembered your great love and faithfulness. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would renew our hearts and spirits, make us steadfast and faithful, 
loyal to you in all we do. Lead us away from our rebellious ways and into a life that honors and glorifies you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon from God's word. Yet the Lord, being compassionate, atoned for our iniquity and did not destroy his people. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up his wrath. Please rise as we sing the hymn, Our Hope in Life and Death. Ushers will come forward and we'll lift up our tithes and our offerings unto the Lord.
Please stand for the doxology. Lord, please accept our offerings and use them to advance your kingdom. Amen. You may be seated. In John 16:33, we read. Wait, wait. I think we have the next song. <laughs> okay, it looks like we're doing a song before. I'm sorry. <laughs> Blessed be your name. <laughs> we're flexible. Give and take. 
Thank you. You may be seated. And special thanks to Barb and Ken who are coming back from the missions week where they were working like crazy and they still were able to serve this Sunday. Long introduction today. We've been studying the book of Genesis and we've been looking at it as our lenses, our glasses, as to look at all of life. It becomes the lenses by which believers look at all of reality. Four weeks ago, we learned how Cain killed his brother, Seth. Excuse me, Abel. Do you mind turning me down just a little bit? I feel like I'm echoing up here. Thank you so very much. Three weeks ago, we saw how Cain's descendants built up a godless but very successful society. They were successful but evil. Today, we'll turn the page and we'll look at what the godly society looked like back then, the values and hearts, heart cries of God's people from earliest times. We'll see that Genesis organizes all of humanity into two families. There's Cain's God, ungodly family, and there's Seth's godly family. The question for us today will be, to which family Do we belong? While our biological family of origin plays a part in this, Genesis makes it clear that it's up to each one of us to individually decide which team we're on. Some, like murderous Cain, can seemingly start inside of God's family, and then he revealed his true colors by murdering his brother Abel, and he switched teams to Satan's family. Others, like the cursed prostitute uh, Rahab, not in this list of genealogies, she was thousands of years later, they can have the worst start in life, but somewhere along the way, God works in their hearts and they exhibit faith and they're brought into God's family. The Bible claims that we're either part of God's family or Satan's family. There's no neutral ground. Did, were we able to get the slides to work? Awesome. We're going to show a slide of some genealogies today. Why is that? It's because the ancients were very orally sophisticated. They could hear things that we miss, where our culture has developed more visually, and we can read charts very well. So we'll present some of this information up on these slides to allow you to better track with the sermon. Um, and, And... We probably need a little review because it's been three weeks. We've had two other sermons in between this time. So here's our story so far. All the way back in the beginning at creation, the holy almighty God makes this earth, this universe, and he makes it good. Then he makes humans in his own image as vice regents to rule over all of creation in his name. But Satan deceived our original forebears, Adam and Eve, into rebelling against God, and they incurred on themselves uh, the penalty for their sin, which is death, spiritual death immediately, and eventual physical death. In their despair, the Lord prophesied hope that there would be a war between the woman's uh, seed and Satan's. The Lord said the seed born of the woman would eventually crush Satan's head, although Satan would crush the seed of the woman's heel. This is the very first prophecy in the Bible about Jesus. The result of this prophecy is that all of humanity falls into two camps, into those who believe the prophecy, who are looking forward to a redeemer, to the seed of the woman, Jesus, and those who disregard God or actively rebel against him. Now, after the Lord's prophecy, Eve had great hope that her son Cain would be that promised deliverer who would crush Satan. But when Cain grew up, what did he do? He slew his brother Abel and showed that he was actually the first person in Satan's family. Cain and his descendants retained the image of God in themselves. They were able to make great technological and cultural advancements, but they were godless sexually immoral, and produced a murderous culture. In summary, they were successful but evil. 
Meanwhile, Adam comforted his wife Eve over the death of her son Abel and the treasonous uh, rebellion of her son Cain. She conceived and had another son named Seth, who would be the father of all believers in the family of faith. And Genesis makes it clear, one of two camps. You're either in Cain's ungodly family or you're in Seth's godly family. And which, which side are they on? Okay, <laughs> Seth's over here, Cain's over here. Uh, so today, it's all about contrasting these two genealogies. Now, you'll look at the slides above and you'll see that uh, uh, there's, uh, in the next one, um, you'll see really long ages. And uh, we kind of have a question about how can people live that long in, back in that day. We don't really know how. Many have postulated that maybe there were some different atmospheric conditions back then that allowed people longer lives, but we're not quite sure. You know, genealogies for us, uh, they're kind of ho-hum. They're nothing more than an obscure hobby. Sometimes we'll have a family member do some work on our genealogies, and they'll go back a few generations. I actually have a great uncle who's gone back like 10 or, or 12 generations, and he's done a whole book for our family, and it's now in the Iowa State Archives, where it's kind of interesting for our family, but for the rest of the world, it will probably be forgotten. And a funny story, my son Cole was talking with my 106-year-old grandmother who's actually watching this service, and she was giving him the county records of, of her um, little small town in Iowa where she grew up, and she said, this reaches back 100 years before I was born. And Cole just incredulously said, like, the time of the Revolutionary War? And <laughs> he, he, he was... He was only 50 years off. It was 50 years after the revolution, but it was 40 years before the Civil War. So uh, pretty, pretty amazing how long our memories can go back. Uh, but unlike us, ancients, the ancients found genealogies fascinating. Your genealogy was similar to your resume. It would let someone know your family, your country of origin, your family business, your family values, your religion, uh, let you know your allies and your enemies. It also let people know that your story was real history and not mythology. Uh, and, and that's a question that we all have here because we see the incredibly long lives in Genesis and we think, oh, maybe is this mythological? But actually, it's very grounded compared to some of the other lists of kings that we get from the Sumerian kings that lived anywhere from 6,000 to 72,000 years. Um, now, we said there, there might be atmospheric conditions, or it may be that, and, and good theologically conservative Bible scholars believe this, that they say maybe there's symbolic numbers in this that are based on the Sumerian Babylonian system of counting by 60. And you can think of these genealogies as trying to present truth, but in an impressionistic way, where they're giving realistic, they're painting in broad strokes, and they're trying to give a realistic impression, but the, more of the mood of the scene rather than the exact details. For in, instance, in this genealogy, we'll see there are a number of important points are made with the number seven, which means divine completeness, or 10, which means general fulfill, uh, completeness. Many genealogies in the Bible are stylized in this way to, in order to make a theological point. For instance, in Matthew, he's got three groups of 14 or six groups of seven that lead to Jesus as the seventh seven. And he, he's, he's not telling a fib. Everyone in the ancient world knew what he was doing. He was trying to show a theological point through the genealogy. Perfectly acceptable. Along these lines, um, when it says that one man fathered another, that term in Hebrew, fathered, could mean that he's the actual father of that 
person or the forefather of the person. The Bible uses that term father in both ways. So a genealogy like this could have a few blanks in a, a few generations skipped over, even though it's generally telling the historical uh, trait. On the other hand, and I think convincingly, this genealogy is very specific about the date of the man's fathering and the birth and the death of the men. And it seems like it's trying to give an actual historical account. Um, so I don't think that this genealogy has gaps in the generations. So then some of you are thinking, well, that begs the question, can we tell the age of this world from this genealogy? Maybe. There was a, uh, a very astute scholar from Ireland named Bishop Usher, and he calculated that if these are direct fathers, then the world was created in 4004 BC. This could be true. But in the following gene genealogies, particularly if you look in chapter 10, there's another list of names, and there may be many generations gapped, and I think that's the case, and, and we can have a discussion on why I think that's the case. But that could lengthen humans' time on Earth by hundreds, if not thousands of years, but not millions. So that's a, a long introduction. <laughs> we're, don't worry, we're, we're about mm, two, at least one third of the way through. Let's read the actual scripture. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. The following verses we're going to skip over, and they include Enosh, Kenan, Meheliel, and Jared. But you want to note that each of these men lived around 900 years, fathered uh, the next in the godly line, and that each had sons and daughters, and that each died. We carry on in verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived, after he had fathered Lamech, 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. He was the oldest man in the Bible. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the holy, inerrant word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Uh, Heavenly Father, you have been so faithful to build the family of believers on this earth. You have grown your kingdom so that people from all over the world are now part of the spiritual family of faith work in our hearts this day that we might join believers everywhere to worship you and to work to bring others into your family for the glory of Jesus. That's our heart's cry today. Amen. The question for today is, are you a person of faith in the family of God? This text is relevant for all of us wherever we find ourselves. If you're not in God's family, you know how to get into it. If you are in God's family, you can be living out your calling and enjoying that. 
If you're not sure whether you're in God's family or not, you can examine yourself whether you're in or not. Here are four hallmarks of the people of faith, four characteristics of God's family here on earth. The first characteristic, characteristic of a person of faith is that they make Christ their highest priority. This genealogy tells us that the men in this list made their relationship with God their all in all, their chief priority, their number one goal in life. We know very little about them, but the few details we do know reveal what they valued. In contrast to God, Godless Cain, who murdered his brother and he fled away from God's presence, we see Seth, the first in this godly line, and his son Enosh start to call upon the name of the Lord. They didn't turn from God, but they turned to God. If we trace this phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, through Scripture, we'd see in Genesis and other places that are always a shorthand for worshiping the Lord. For example, when Abraham set up altars, he would call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, when Elijah was telling the people to turn back from their worship of Baal and turn to the Lord God, he said, won't you turn from Baal and call upon the name of the Lord? When people in the New Testament in a, in a region were converted and they started to believe in Jesus, then it described them as people in the region started to call upon the name of the Lord. They started to worship the Lord. So that's a question for all of us. Do we have a burning desire to worship the Lord? Is Sunday the most important hour of your week? Do you think about praising God for his goodness in your life on a daily basis? Well, alongside Seth and Enosh, there are two other individuals, Enoch and Noah. And they are commended for walking with God. What does walking with God mean? Usually, you only walk together with someone who's a close friend, a confidant. Because if you journey together any distance, any length of time, you need to be going in the same direction. And that could mean literally or metaphorically. To walk together, to journey together, you have to have things in common. You have to agree on so many things that you naturally gravitate towards one another. You want to spend time with one another. Uh, Laura, for example, has been in a prayer group with three other ladies for over a decade. And they've gone through the joys and sorrows of life. They have rejoiced at births. They have sorrowed and grieved together at deaths. They have raised their children together. They have shed tears with one another. They have hugged and cried with one another and built each other up with godly prayers. They are bond, bound together because of walking together through life. Enoch and Noah walked with God and were bound together with him. Uh, they believed in his word. They agreed that his commandments were right and good that his presence was the greatest blessing in their lives. Their joys and sorrows were God's joys and sorrows. Their heart was so bound up with his. And because their hearts were bound up with his, their walking in faith, or walking with God, meant that their faith revealed itself in action. Uh, they lived lives of faithful obedience. They walked in with God. Excuse me. They walked in the light as God is in the light. And that's a question for you. Are you walking with God? Are you walking in the light as he is in the light? Do you call upon the name of the Lord? Is he your priority? Is personal Bible reading and prayer something that delights you? Do you look for opportunities to grow spiritually? Do you mark him as the number one priority on your calendar with your money? Is, it, is he the first check, your, your tithe check, your first check of the month, or your last one, if you can? Is church non-negotiable, or is it something that you try and squeeze in in a busy schedule? With your interests, is he number, number one? 
with your hospitality. A person of faith holds Christ as their highest priority. A second trait of the family of God is that they value human life made in the image of God. The first man, Adam, was made in the image of God. And this chapter's first verses affirm that all of us have inherited that image of God from him, whether male or female. Both believers and unbelievers are made in the image of God and therefore endowed with uh, value and worth. We're to treat everyone with dignity and respect. Three men in this genealogy reveal that they value other humans, and they're contrasted with the previous genealogy of godless Cain, the seventh from his line produced a, a piece of work named Lamech. And he was the one that boasted that he had killed someone for wounding him. And you can see him on this side of the slide versus these other three names on this side. So they're contrasted in these three ways. Lamech, the seventh from Adam on, the, on Cain's side, he murders a man where Enoch, the seventh from Adam on the godly side, does not die. We'll learn more about that in the next point. Murderous Lamech uses his words. He's the only one in that genealogy that speaks to say, boast, I've killed a man. Where the only one in this genealogy to, use, to speak is Lamech, obviously a, a parallel, and he uses his words to prophesy that his son Noah will bring the godly line relief from their painful toil, and really from this godless society that Cain's descendants are pushing upon them. We'll see more about that in the next week. The murderous Lamech, has, who has three sons, boasts of killing someone, where Noah, the godly one, who has three sons, ends up saving humanity. These three contrasts strongly imply that we bear more of God's image when we uphold other image bearers, when we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. So we love God by loving people made in his image. Much later, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And this is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. So we're giving ourselves up for the benefit of others. We cannot have callous disregard for other people made in God's image. We have to care for them. We may even hate the evil that people have done, and yet we cannot hate them. This is a hallmark of the family of faith. See, the family of faith values other image bearers, including children. Of all the information that we have been given about this genealogy, uh, we're told that they had many sons and daughters. And that's not saying that we have a hierarchy of valuing married couples over single folks. Not at all. Because all of us can have spiritual sons and daughters. Uh, single people, widowed people can have all sorts of spiritual fruit as they are investing in their spiritual children's lives. It's just the most common way of having spiritual children is through raising them in the home. And as a side note, uh, just ironically for decades we've been hearing about overpopulation, but now the latest trends are, are that we're not experiencing a global population explosion, but someday, it, very soon, it's going to be a global population implosion, and that all but Africa, the societies are going to rapidly age and rapidly decrease. But believers have always cherished children, whether biological, adopted, spiritual children. In a world of fear, we are not afraid of welcoming children into this world because it reminds us of the hope that we were given in the seed of the woman that would crush Satan's head. And that seed has come in Jesus. But every time we have a child, we remember that the way God chose to save the world was by sending a little baby down into this world. So in, in Roman times, the New Testament Christians would pick up little babies from the garbage heaps where they'd been laid out there to be exposed to the elements, and they would take them home and adopt them. Currently, we have pregnancy centers all around this country that show women 
ultrasounds of their babies in, in, in the womb um, to try and nudge them in a way that they would keep their babies or at least give them up for adoption. And we have many adoption aid agencies that are run by believers. Uh, so the family of faith values other image bearers, especially children that remind us of the baby sent down to earth to save this world. A third trait of the family of faith is that we look to relief from Christ's resurrection. If you read through Christian hi history, you would see that believers throughout every age thought their age was the worst and that it couldn't get any, any worse and that they were praying and hoping that Jesus would come back because they thought they were going through the tribulation. Believers have always had a hard time in this world. and They've always prayed that Jesus would come back and make it right. But as we saw a few weeks ago, even as Cain's godly, excuse me, godless family was developing a society that was evil and cru cruel, lots of good things were happening as well. Technological advancements and, and things that made life better here on earth. It's kind of like the best of times, the worst of times. We look at the last century and we see more people were slaughtered in warfare and in genocide than any other century. And at the same time, more people were converted to Christ. And the church was built up more than any other church, excuse me, uh, century in the history of the world. We would be rightly appalled by some of the things that our ancestors thought totally acceptable. They would be rightly appalled at some of the things we take for granted. But the point is, in, in a fallen world, believers in every age have looked for relief. Remember that the very first in this line, Seth, he was a replacement for Abel, who was slain by his brother. And Cain's line just got worse and worse. We'll see that more next week. It became so bad that they controlled all of culture, and there was only eight righteous people left, maybe even just one righteous person left in all of humanity. That's why godly Lamech, not the murderous Lamech, but the godly Lamech, uh, was looking to relief from the Lord through his son Noah. He was the seed of the woman for that generation. He would partially fulfill that prophecy and he would be a foreshadowing of Christ. And as we read in the service, Enoch, three generations before Noah, was preaching that the world was living in ungodly uh, unrighteousness. It was an increasingly wicked world that should repent. Where do believers look to for relief? They're always looking to a redeemer in the seeds of the woman. Throughout the Bible, whenever God's people really need special help, God will spend a, send a special redeemer, a Messiah, a Christ, to rescue them in that time and space. Each mini-redeemer points forward to Christ, like Noah saving his family in the ark, so in Christ's blood we are all saved. The relief that we're looking for from our redeemer is, of course, Jesus, in Jesus, through his resurrection. Where do we see that in the text? Adam was made in the image of God. And Seth and all of us inherit that uh, image of God, creativity and relational abilities. But it also says that Seth was made in Adam's image. And remember, Adam's image was marred, distorted, by the sin nature that he took upon himself and the death that that incurred. So Adam gave life to Seth, but he also gave him death. And in the same way, from all of our parents, we inherit life and death. Despite all of these men living really long lives into almost into their uh, millennia, for many of them, they all died with one exciting exception. Eight times over, we read in this genealogy, and he died, 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 and he died. That's one long obituary. 
by recording these deaths, the godly family is making it abundantly clear that it still depends on the grace of God, that this family needs a solution for death. They need a resurrection that only Jesus can provide. In this family's very founding, there's the figurative re- resurrection. Cain killed his brother Abel, and Seth was, has resurrected the, the godly line. He was the seed of the woman for his generation. He pointed forward, of course, to the seed of the woman, the ultimate seed of the woman, Jesus, who would not figuratively resurrect, but literally resurrect. He physically rose from the dead. Now, Jesus is that ultimate resurrection whom the the godly family looks to in faith. Now, besides Seth, there is another great highlight of a resurrection in this genealogy, and that is Enoch, who walked with the Lord three or 65 years until his, the birth of his son, Methuselah, and then 300 years with God, and he was not, for God took him. One preacher described it this way, that Enoch and God were having such good conversations as they talked and walked together, that they decided they were better, God decided they were better suited for heaven than on earth. So the Lord ushered Enoch into heaven, one of only two men in the Bible to never die. We don't know how he went out. Was it like Elijah with a chariot of fire? We don't know. But the family of God has always looked to relief from the Lord through a resurrection. Just like our spiritual forebears in this genealogy, we are keenly aware of our sin and the death that it brings on our descendants. And we look to Christ over and over again for a resurrection. That we know that as we confess our sins to him, as we trust in his substitutionary atonement on the cross, as we find ourselves in him, joined with him, that we will one day share in that physical resurrection. And we find our immortality in Christ's resurrection. There's one more contrast here. There's the godly Enoch who never dies, and he's contrasted with uh, the godless Enoch of chapter 4, who was the son of Cain. Cain built this city for the glory of man. He wanted his name to go on forever and ever. But it was immortality here on earth, where Enoch looked to humbly walk with the Lord, and his immortality was literal immortality because he walks with God in heaven even now. One of only two men in the Bible never to die. Everyone who walks in Enoch's footsteps, who calls upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. Our names will be written in the Lamb's book of life, and we will receive a crown of life, and will reign with Christ forever and ever. So a person of faith looks for relief in Christ's resurrection. The fourth and final characteristic of a person of faith in the family of God is they have a burning desire to pass their faith on to the next generation. Where do we see this desire to pass on the faith to the next generation in this text? As we mentioned before, this genealogy just has a few tidbits of information about these men, but this information that we do have is profound. In ungodly Cain's line, everyone was successful. All of Lamech's sons were geniuses in their fields. Jubal in music, Jabal with herding animals, Tubal, Cain with metallurgy. In this line of Seth, none of the accomplishments of these persons were recorded. We don't know if they were successful or not. But they were significant because these men wanted to know, wanted future generations to know that they were made in the image of God, that they were people who called on the name of the Lord, who walked with God. They're forever marked as men who believed in the promise of the seed of the woman, who believed in a redeemer, in a resurrection, and that they gave their faith to the next generation 
to another godly couple who would carry on their legacy. And it changed the course of history in this world and the eternal destinies of all who follow after them. If you are in the family of faith, next to your chief desire of knowing Christ for yourself is a burning desire for your children, for your family, for your friends to know Christ as you do. Personally, I want my children to know that I love Jesus. I love the church. I love their mom, my wife, that Jesus is my all in all. I want them someday to be telling their children, Jesus is my all in all, that I chose a a spouse who loved the Lord, that I chose uh, to raise my children to know the Lord. I pray the same for all of you. Now, maybe your children have already grown out of the house, and during the time that you were raising them, the Lord wasn't your number one priority. You've only recently grown in your faith. Or maybe somehow you were not able to convey your faith to them. You can pray that God would restore the years the locusts took. I'm sure there are many stories that were not recorded here, but they sure are recorded in the other pages of Scripture of how someone like a Judah was walking away from the family and through the prayers of his father and mother were brought back into the fold. You can do the same with a spouse that's not walking with the Lord. The Lord is gracious and kind, and he will honor many of these prayers. If you still have young people in your homes, I pray that you would open up your Bible around the dinner table and in family devotions uh, and and at bedtime and, and just open God's word in your home. Hear, let your children hear you pray out loud. So are you part of the family of God? Is Christ your highest priority? Do you value other people made in his image? Do you look for relief from your struggles, from Christ's resurrection? Do you desire to pass your faith on to others? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Christ has been our hope for every generation, and he's certainly our hope for years to come eternity to come. Let our faith in you, in him, determine our very identity, the deepest desires of our hearts, the course of our lives, both here and into eternity. For Christ's fame we pray. Amen. Please rise as we sing for all the saints.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen.